Good morning. This is April 10th, 2000, here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. And this morning we are privileged to have with us Herbert Ross. Good morning, Herbert. How are you? Good I'm going to call you Herb, a little less formal. May I start out by asking you your age? I'm 77. 77 years old and your current address? Wayland. And your marital status? I'm married. Married. Do you have children? Yes, I have five. Five children? Five children. I get asked then, do you have grandchildren? I have uh, three. Three grandchildren. Right. You've got a good life. Herb, where, where were you born? Uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland. How did you come to be born in Belfast? Well, my mother and father both lived there at that time. They're both native <clears throat> Northern Irish. Uh, my father emigrated in 1925 to this country, and we followed him in 1927. So you are an immigrant? I'm an immigrant. Good for you. Yeah, I That's made it. <laughs> good for you. Where were you raised after your family came here? I was raised in Boston, particularly in uh, Dorchester and Jamaica Plain. Is that where your family, uh, your dad lived? Or dad worked? lived and worked in those yeah. areas. What he kind was, of work did he do? He was a store manager for a uh, now defunct uh, butter and egg or creamery store, mm -hmm. Kennedy's. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm sure you remember them from the 30s and the 40s. Yeah, yeah. They're and wh what did your mom do? She was a homemaker. She never... Uh, with five children? No, yes. no, just with me. I was a single child. And no others. Oh, oh, that's right. You're the one that right. had five children. That's the one. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, what's your affinity with Natick? Did the family move out here? or? Did no, I came out here to work in a Kennedy store which was on Main Street at that time in 19, uh, 15, 1948. I come out here that... Uh, Did you move to Natick or...? Yes, I moved. Yeah. I married that May in 1948 and we mo I moved into Natick. And where did you meet your bride? I met her in Boston. We and worked was together. She, was she Irish as well? She's an Irish-American, yes. That's great. That's great. What was uh, Natick like when you got here? You got here in 48? Uh, 48. 48. It was more as it was, I guess, from the 20s and the 30s. It was very uh, uh, a neighborhood town. Mm -hmm. the, where where in was, town did you live? I lived on Plain Street. Okay. And the, uh, you could, very easy to know, working on Main Street, to know the people in the town at that time, because the uh, I guess the population was more centered in Natick. Did you walk to work every morning? Oh, yes. Yeah. I had no car, I think, at that time at all. And what was traffic like? Uh, much lighter. Much lighter. You <laughs> much could actually make a left turn. Yeah, yeah. There was no one-way streets. <laughs> yeah. Was it from Natick that you entered the military? No, I entered it from uh, Jamaica Plain. Tell us about that now. Uh, how did you come to go into the military? Well, I attempted as, I was a British citizen in 1941, 1942, and uh, I attempted to volunteer for the Canadian Army and the Royal Air Force. And I was refused because they didn't at that time want to interfere with the American draft process. So I was drafted in uh, uh, March of 1943. When you were drafted in 43, did you have a choice as to what branch of service you were yes, going to? Yes, I did. And you chose? I, my father was in the Army, so I thought I should, be <laughs> I should be in the Army. Okay. Did you give any thought to the other services other than Not your enough. historic? <laughs> Not enough. Not <laughs> enough. Okay, you're in the Army in March of 43. Uh, did you go into Boston and you were shipped out of there? Yes, we were brought into a... Commonwealth Avenue, I remember, I think, and uh, from there we went to Camp Evans. You said we. Did, did anybody else join with you? Yes, it was a group left from the local draft board, maybe uh, uh, 20 or 25. Well, I mean, any personal friends in this group, people? It was I went to school, school with uh, two or three of them, yes. Yeah. I remember there. I was still have the, actually, I have the draft order uh, yet at home. Was, was this uh, high school friends? Or? Yes, high school friends from Jamaica Plain. And you all decided you're going to get drafted, so you went together? No, I, I think it was just uh, as, as it happened. 
we uh, just uh, was coincidence they were with me. Okay. Whereabouts in Boston did you collect at that time? Uh, I think in Commonwealth Avenue. There was a building Up there. Up at the armory there? I, I, Timberly, I can't really remember the building. Yeah, well, okay. Possibly the armory. And what happened to you then? You were sworn in and uh, you're in the army. Now. Right. We were sworn in previously yeah. when we were physically examined and they'd let you have a week off, put you on leave for a week and brought you back. And uh, from there you went to Camp Devons. Now, they were what, sworn in initially. What did your family think about uh, this? They, they I, were Irish. Yeah. They came over here to America and their son's going right. into the military services. What did they think about this? Well, my father was in the British Army during the World War I. Yeah. And it was, seemed a, a matter of fact to him. It was the thing to the do. The thing to do. Yeah. What did your yeah. mom think? Uh, she was uh, accepted it very well. Of course, she's seen her brothers were in the war, and I think they were used to uh, seeing men leave for wars. I think you just said you uh, were sent to Fort Devens. Yes. What happened to you there? We were just equipped there, clothing, a physical examination, and waiting to be uh, uh, sent out to uh, a unit. This being sent out to a unit, um were you given tests, or how did they decide who would go where? I think they just, <laughs> where, where they needed you. Luck uh, of the draw kind Luck of, of the draw, I think. Uh, and I, that's what happened to us, I believe, that group at Camp Devons, they were forming a, a new armored division, so they uh, were sent as a group, I think the majority of us. Did you have any druthers? Would you, did you hope that they would send you to uh, do something other than going into whatever you wound up in? And they, and there was no uh, choice, I think. And I would have, of course, you would have preferred to be at a unit that would be less arduous. <laughs> but uh, you just, I, we just accepted it. Now, did you say you were sent to an armored division? Yes. What is an armored division? Armored division is principal a mixture of engineers, uh, tanks, and infantry. And where were you sent to? We were sent to Camp Polk in Louisiana. That's a long way out of Boston. Had you ever been out of I, Boston before? Or I think the farthest I'd ever been out of Boston before was uh, maybe New Hampshire. So this was your first choice, your first opportunity to see the Deep South? Yes. Did you go down on a train? We went down on a troop train. What was that like? Uh, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. The conditions went, you know, food yeah. and... Uh, it was a coach cars, old coach cars, and it was a long, it was a long, difficult trip. Okay, you're in Camp Polk, Louisiana, and you step off the train. And you're just uh, immediately taken to, uh, brought to a company area, and of course you're broken up into units, and I was, uh, I was a, uh, assigned to headquarters and headquarters company of the 36th Armored Regiment which was part of this new 8th Armored Division. <clears throat> and with the, the uh, fellows that went down with you or that, that you had been together with in Boston? I think they were dispersed. So you, they, were, you were pretty much on your own well, pretty, now? Very, very much on your own, okay. yes. Okay. Now what kind of uh, training did you get there? Well, we went through an eight-week basic training course and uh, familiarity with weapons, uh, vehicles, military drill, uh, and it lasted uh, that entire time. The most of it was uh, on vehicles, based on the use of the vehicles and their weapons. What kind of weapons? Well, we had the uh, medium uh, tank, the Sherman, which was a 75 millimeter gun, and the, uh, the light tank, which had a 37 millimeter gun, and we're given courses in the uh, which I, I was me mechanically deficient. I'd never had a car, my family never had a car, so I was uh, <coughs> at the bottom of the uh, list for, uh, for driving or for, you know, mechanical aptitude. Did you deal more with the weapons on the tank? Uh, I think more of the, at that time, of the, just the handling of them, the driving of them. You were driving a tank around now? Yeah, to a light tank. I'd done yeah. for a, a l small amount of driving on it. And vehicles, you'd uh, be on the large, uh, the jeeps and the large trucks and the half trucks. 
which we had. What about infantry weapons? Uh, were you no, we not? You were not in the infantry. No, we didn't have infantry weapons. Okay, we so had. they didn't hand you a Garand or a Springfield. No, we were handed a carbine mm -hmm. or a submachine gun as part of the armored force. Rising or Thompson? At that time, it was Thompson, mm -hmm. and uh, later it became the what we call the grease gun. It was a, a, a tinny-looking affair. Yeah, yeah. If I if I'm following you correctly, this you you're up to about June of '43 now. Uh, no, that was they sent us down immediately. We were down there and. Well, you say I that you were there for eight weeks. Yeah. And uh, you're was down it? in the summer now, aren't yes. you? Yes. Yeah. What was that like for you from out of Boston? Oh, it was uh, terrible. You know the uh, humidity and the heat, especially with vehicles with tanks. And this was basic training, so you're not about to get much liberty or furlough. Time, no, there was no furloughs and no, uh, no liberties, no uh, three-day passes, nothing of that. Uh, the closest we got to uh, recreation was the uh, post exchange. And so you can go in and buy your Zippo lighter uh, and things. Yeah, and buy your soft drinks. <laughs> yeah. What did you like or, or dislike about what was happening to you down there? I think just the conditions, you know, being uh, under, uh, uh, new to me, being under a discipline, uh, being under the thumb of uh, non-commissioned officers, because they were, uh, they made it very basic, their treatment of you. They gave you a hard time? They would I mean, give it, you it a hard time. It was pretty tough for you? It was pretty tough, yeah. The military, you understood pretty well that you were going to be shipped out somewhere yes. sometime. Did the military, the United States Army, prepare you for any of the uh, cultural differences you might be facing? I don't think you know at this time if you'd go to Europe or the Pacific, but they did they say to you you're going to be with different people? No. No, nothing, nothing like at that. All. What about your equipment? Do you feel you were you were happy? Oh, I think we're adequately equipped. Good stuff. Yeah, good clothing. Good, stuff. good clothing. Yes. Good food and camp there. Uh, well, I was called it fair. I think the people that cooked had never cooked before. I think the only cook was the uh, mess sergeant who didn't actually cook. But the rest of them were just. Uh, rushed into the uh, fill the places. Yeah. Did your duties change at any time throughout your military career or what you were learning now is basically what you did? Oh yes, they trained radically, changed radically. Uh, okay, well we'll get to that as we yeah. as we go along. Uh, where did you go, f or you were there eight weeks now in yes, Louisiana? Yes, that was the start of it, yes. Okay, where did you go from there? We stayed there, we made that camp we were that that camp to sent overseas. Okay. For that from Mar from May of 19, from, excuse me from March roughly in March of 1943 till May of 1944, and uh, you were there more than a year. Yes. Is it was training all this time. Which, but what happened was the armored division was reformed. They went from a regimental basis to a battalion basis, and we were uh, uh, shrunken out of that division and to form a separate tank battalion. Why did that happen? Is that something that the military felt that was better to do? Yeah, it they must have learned that by experience they could handle their uh, battalions much better in combat than they could a regiment. And so the, uh, the all armored divisions were uh, reformed on battalion basis instead of regimental basis. And we were the extras and we were formed into a separate tank battalion. Did you go on anything that, uh, I, I guess the books refer to as maneuvers, did you take off in, uh, f the Red Army against the Blue Army? Yes, yeah, we did. Tell us about that. Well, we were, uh, I think we spent more time cooperating uh, with each other as a unit. Uh, I don't remember any large scale, uh, uh, as a tank battalion, any large scale involvement of infantry units. We, f we formed, uh, from the battalion we formed the opposing units facing mm -hmm. each other. And we were out on field problems in the Louisiana maneuver area uh, during that period, but never with large-scale infantry units. Okay. Early newsreels that, that you and I have both seen that to go back to 40 or early 41 show soldiers out there with broomsticks and a truck that was on the side of it was labeled tank. Do you? Did you have your full equipment at this oh, time? Oh yes, we did. At and modern time, equipment. 1943, we did. We 
we did of the all the we had the half tracks and the vehicles of all you know tanks. We had all of that. We have no uh, imitation equipment or or vehicles. Did you hear what was going on in the rest of the war where you were? I think it was very limited what we heard. We didn't have individual radios, and there was no. I don't remember any uh, uh, newspapers circulating, not even a army newspaper. So we had a very limited information about what was going on. By '43, the the Americans uh, had invaded North Africa, and had. Uh, done very badly, as you recall, right. in the Battle of the Kasserine Pass, yes. because our tanks and equipment were inferior to what they were up right. against. Uh, did you see any reaction to that in what you had? I felt uh, myself that, uh, that knowing the tank itself, the Sherman, I thought it was a tank that wasn't, uh, you know, advanced enough for for the time we were in. I think the, uh, especially the Germans, had much better tanks. I couldn't understand the early, the ones that they used in North Africa, that so many of those grants with the side turret, mm -hmm. and even the Sherman with this high profile. I thought they were, uh, we were behind in the uh, design and the construction of tanks. But I think there was no general uh, uh, comment on it at all. I don't remember any. Well, I guess my question is also, did you see any change in the equipment? Did the Americans produce a Model 2 or a Model 3? No, not basically. It didn't change that Sherman until the very, uh, I remember, late in the war, until they uh, put a new gun into it. They put a 90 millimeter gun in when we were preparing mm -hmm. for Japan. 90 millimeter? Yes. They took the 75 millimeter out. <clears throat> but the tank itself, I don't think, changed at all, in our experience in the Pacific. Okay, we're up to where in 1944 now? We're up to, uh, when we're leaving for uh, the Pacific. Okay, what, about what month is this? About May of 1944. May of 44. You get orders one day to stand by, you're going to be shipped out. You're going to be shipped as out. As a battalion. As a unit. Uh, okay. Um, where did you go? We went to uh, uh, San Francisco, to Camp Stoneman, actually, in uh, Pittsburgh, California. And how long were you there? I think we were only there a couple of weeks. By the time they went through the process of giving us the shots, and uh, just the, uh, that in that time period, did you get any opportunity to see San Francisco? Yes, I was in San Francisco for That's one, one day. One day. Yeah. Uh, all right. Is it possible to load a battalion on a single ship? Yes, we loaded onto a uh, Dutch freighter called the Bosch Fontaine, and uh, we were alone. You sailed out alone? We sailed out alone. No convoy? No convoy. And where did you land? We landed at uh, Oro Bay in New Guinea. No stops on the way? We stopped at Milne Bay, which is on the uh, eastern tip of New Guinea. Tell us about that now. You're on the deck of a ship and... It looks uh, very wonderful, the shoreline. You know, it's uh, the waving trees and the uh, uh, sand and the water, the colors of the water. It looked very reasonable from the... Uh, looking back on ads for Hawaii and the West Indies. Had you been told where you were going? No, we weren't told. You didn't know when you saw we that land know. come up what it was? Uh, I, I don't think I, we were told at all. It was just a, a, you know, a Pacific destination we came into. Okay, did you feel you were going into direct contact with the enemy? I thought we no. We I knew th we knew that we weren't going to go into direct contact with the enemy at that point. That was going to be a a staging area for us. Okay, tell us now where you so landed specifically. At Oro Bay. Oro Bay, and yeah. you unloaded as a battalion. Unloaded, and we went into a uh, camp area. Okay, at this time, what was your rank? At that time, I was a uh, private first class. PFC, PFC, and you've been in the Army a little over a year, a over a year. and you're already overseas and uh, girding up for uh, contact right. with the enemy. Okay. Tell us what you did from the time you landed. Uh, the time I landed, I had become a, uh, I'd become into battalion headquarters. <clears throat> I was asked by the, uh, the uh, tech, tech sergeant in charge of the personnel section 
if I'd like a, a, a job in their position. So I said, fine, because when I had finished basic training and during the training in the United States, I was a, what they call a basic. I had no special uh, uh, training, no specialist. I wasn't, a, I was a non-specialist. So I said, yes, well, uh, that sounds pretty good. What were they asking you to do? They were asking me to be, uh, come into the personnel section to work. Uh, be a, just simply a record keeper for them of uh, for the battalion for the battalion. Okay, at this point, were you aware that you were working for Douglas MacArthur, or where you were, or what you were supposed uh, to do? Yes, I, I knew that command was that Southwest Pacific was under Douglas MacArthur, uh, and uh, we knew there was a preparatory time we were going to go through before they they would use us. And you knew now you were in New Guinea. Yes. Did, and were you shown maps and said, uh, "This is your objective. This is where we're going to go." No. You no, just no. we just were took there. a day at a time. Day at a time. That's about the best way to describe it. Okay. When you're in personnel now. Right. Um, what were the guys doing who were driving the tanks? And um, they were through the training. They started to train more with infantry units, and uh, of course they had. Uh, uh, they were in range, kind of quite a bit of time in ranges, firing their weapons. I'd done that in the United States, but now I was in this position where I was, I was free from that. <clears throat> Can you comment on that? The fact that the United States Army, up up till they landed in New Guinea, didn't think tanks belonged in the South Pacific very much. No, they simply uh, it was a small use of them in the Pacific overall. Uh, up to that point. I think New Guinea was uh, uh, all the New Guinea battles at that time, they had one tank battalion perhaps supporting all those units. Uh, they simply used them in segments, platoons and companies. I think the uh, first airport that was captured was a small island just to the north of New Guinea and that was the first use of the tanks, but I don't know if it's, it was the the 775th? No, we weren't involved that, in that. That was not no, you. I think okay. there was a unit 706 was yeah. involved in the New Guinea campaign. Well, did I ask you at all in here what was the number of your battalion? No, I don't think so. Okay. Se well, 775th Tank Battalion. It was you? Yes. Okay. But well, we weren't involved in the New Guinea battles. Okay. Yeah. All righty. How long were you at this particular place before you started to move? We were there till uh, I think uh, December of 1944. Okay, yeah. and you're you're kind of everybody is starting to move up toward the tip, and then move right, out they're on of the, there. They're on the brink of moving okay. into the Philippines. Now, how did you hear about what was going on in the rest of the war? As I said before, I can't remember much information from the rest of the war. We. There was no, I think there was no news of any sort to us. There was no, we, of course we didn't have individual radios. No stars and stripes, nothing? I don't remember news. Well, you no. <laughs> sound like an abandoned unit. <laughs> yeah, we were a battalion, I guess, a little, a little account. Okay, you're moving into the first of the new year, is that correct, of right. 45? Yeah, we we're in, we were getting, we were being, we were being embarked for use in Luzon. Would, were you talking to anybody who had been further along in combat and they're coming back to you and saying this is what's happening around you? No, not no. at all. I don't remember anybody. All right. So they loaded you up or they prepared you to move to the Philippines. Right. Okay. Now tell us about that because that's, that's a good stretch too. Yeah. We, they loaded us on the LST, the landing ship tank, Yeah. Uh, at uh, Oro Bay. And we uh, moved up the coast slowly, I guess, to gain uh, other components for the convoy. I think we spent uh, two or three days on Alandia, which is farther up the coast from Oro Bay. Yeah, so you assembly. were no longer a single ship sailing. No, we were sailing ocean. as a group, as a convoy. How big a convoy was it? I don't think it was over large, if I remember right. What capital ships did you have? I don't. You? I think all we had was destroyers. Destroyers. I think by that time the air power over. The Japanese air power over the Luzon was destroyed, and they could operate with uh, lesser ships. Did they tell you specifically you were headed for the Philippine Islands? Yes, they did. 
specifically for Luzon. While you were there, uh, before you left New Guinea, uh, were you aware of airfields being built around you or any of the constructions going on? They'd been largely left behind. There was a large one near us called, I think, very well known in New Guinea called Dabaduro. And that had been uh, abandoned as they moved up the coast. In fact, we used uh, some of the materials for our uh, tent floors, the metal. Uh, bases of the they use metals. Uh, oh, the sheets, mats. Yeah. Mats. Yeah. We use those for flooring. So the the Dubador was largely abandoned, I think, at that time. They'd moved farther up the coast. Their air bases. Okay. And on what particular date, if you can uh, remember, did you sail off for the Philippine Islands? December 1944. December 44. Late in the month. I think I remember spending my birthday at Alandia. That was the 22nd. So we were there. We were, we were between the 22nd and the uh, beginning of January, we were at sea. And uh, how long were you at sea? About, I'd say about between seven and nine days before we approached uh, Luzon. And All right, now tell us about this. You're going into conflict, really. Right right up against it now. Yeah, we were in going in on what they called, uh, I suppose, D plus two. I don't know if they use D anymore, but yeah. it was the second day. Yeah. And the, the beaches were abandoned. The Japanese had changed their strategy of meeting you on the beach. They waited to get you inland. Inland, that, yes. Yeah. I've got that uh, Douglas MacArthur landed on the 9th at Luzon, and you were 100 miles from Manila. Was you part of that, or did you no. see anything of that? No, we didn't. We didn't engage uh, in the Manila battle. We engaged in the battle of Northern Luzon. Okay, in the, tell, in the mountains. Tell us about that being on, in Luzon now. Well, we we turned up into the mountains. We turned after we landed. We turned left into the mountains, and we had a set up a headquarters at a town called Asingan. Would you spell that? A S N A S I N G A N. A signan. A signan. It was a uh, uh, a small Filipino town. They had a piazza, a large church, and an open air market. Uh, a very it was a basic Philippine town. And from there, we sent out uh, units to support the infantry divisions facing the Japanese in the mountains of northern Luzon. Uh, in the Belidi Pass area, in the Baguio Front, and we used those. Uh, we supported an entire Army Corps with one battalion of tanks. That's how limited their use were. They could use them in the roads, and sometimes they surprised the Japanese by managing to get up on get up on some good good heights. But uh, overall, we never engaged the enemy as a total unit, only separately. But with a 90 millimeter gun, you're talking. No, at that time they still had the, the 90 millimeter gun came in the preparation of the Japanese attack. We still had the 75s. 75s, but, but that's it was portable artillery. Yes, know? it was. It was yeah. portable artillery. That's what they really. We had a, a platoon of 105 millimeters mounted on tank chassis, which were very useful up there. And we had a, a platoon of 81 millimeter mortars on half tracks. Herb, were you now in, in, in combat with the enemy? Only in the opening phases, only in the landing on the beaches. Okay, tell, us, tell us please about that. Well, we, when we came on the beach, it was near nightfall, and they were so sure of uh, the non-activity you know, non of the Japanese Air Force, they lit all the LSTs. So that night, I think, was the first enemy activity when they started to shell the beach. Uh, they had a hidden gun positions up on the uh, on the left of us, in the high ground. And they intermittently shell you during the night, which was, uh, I guess, the large caliber shells. I was told that they were uh, guns that were taken out of the American defenses of uh, Manila they were using. Hmm. So that was the first inkling of uh, we had of combat. You're under fire now, and it's night, and you're in a faraway place. It's uh, very disturbing. <laughs> 
get more specific. What is it like to be in that situation? I think you really, uh, you really don't want to expect. At that, at that point, we were in sand, so we could dig some sort of a hole very easily. Later, when we went into the countryside, uh, uh, at the, the ground was like rock, very difficult to dig in. And you can only dig, and if you had an afternoon to dig, you can only dig a very shallow hole. But that, that opening phase of it was, uh, uh, for someone who had never experienced combat except in stories, it was very, very disturbing. Now, as you m moved in off the beach, I take it it's because the Japs, Japanese were moving away from you. Right. Uh, were you was your unit pr actively pursuing them? Yes, they, they split the units up very quickly and uh, went to the, uh, uh, these various infantry divisions to support them. And uh, we were then, as I said, we went into that town and that became our battalion headquarters, mm -hmm. actually for the entire Battle of Northern Luzon, that was our headquarters. Okay, are you able to tell us some of the numbers of some of the units around you? The, yes. The, the divisions? Right, the 43rd, the 37th, the 33rd, the 6th, uh, the 25th, uh, and I think the 158th Regimental Combat Team for a time. They, they shuttled the divisions sometimes, withdrew some units from the Northern Luzon to aid in the fight for uh, the, the other islands and for Manila. But I remember that first night on the beach with the uh, shells coming over and I think there was, when there was a hole there was an immediate filling of it by more than one. Because <laughs> we were really, I think there was no shells really landed near us, they landed in the beach. I think they landed more in the sea than they did on the beach. And that, you suspect they were shooting at the ships? They were shooting at the lights. I think that's yeah. the only guidance they had. I, I, this is a larger question, but what caused these people to turn on lights when they're under fire? I don't know. Maybe they put them out at that time because we were up <laughs> on the beach. But they were so confident there was no air power and yeah. there was no enemy within reach, they thought. Okay, you weren't wounded. No. Uh, no, I'm glad to know that. Um, on, on one of your papers I read just before this, uh, were you in contact with uh, other units from, uh, say, the Australians or New Zealanders? We only saw the Australians in New Guinea, not as, uh, I think their units had moved up the coast. We only mm -hmm. see the service units, and they had their government, uh, uh, there was a unit that governed the uh, New Guinea Australian. Uh, if you wanted contract labor, you'd go through the Australians for it. What was your opinion of these uh, other nationals? I thought the Australians were very good because I knew something about the Australians. I had an uncle in Australia. He lived there and after leaving Ireland. And I thought they were pretty, a pretty good Pretty group decent of guys. people, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Pretty uh, forthright. And how about the United States Air Force or the, the Navy? Uh, what was over your head at this at time? At that time, I think at uh, the Lingay and Gulf where we landed, the uh, Navy were very active in uh, supporting fire from the ships and also the air power. We were very closely uh, uh, supported by Corsairs, which maybe belonged to you, uh, to the Marines and the Navy. They provided very good close support over the uh, beaches and the uh, and, and into the uh, outlying mountain areas. Did you see any of that, the uh, attacks by planes? I seen them uh, not at the beach, you could, they were moving inland. You could see yeah. them, we'd come over at very low levels. Uh, but uh, I don't remember them afterwards. And how about I was in that, I was in battalion headquarters in that town. Okay, in, how about the big ships? Did you see any of those? Was, I don't think there was any many large ships left at by that D2. They had withdrawn and there was uh, maybe uh, basically destroy us. You talked about this little uh, Philippine town you were in. Right. Um, did you uh, mix with or have anything to do with the locals, the uh, Philippines? Oh yes, we did mix with them. Tell us about that. They're very, uh, very friendly people, of course. They, and there was the profit motive. There was an army unit near them and there was a washerwoman yeah. Uh, there was various tradesmen that were uh, looking for to buy anything, even your clothes. 
And uh, we sold, I think, all our uh, underwear except for our undershirts. <laughs> and the, <laughs> I asked uh, the Filipino, I said, what do you do with this? Uh, what, what's, your, what's your occupation? He said, I buy and sell. Buys and sells. Did you speak Spanish or did no, they speak no, English? I, there was, yes, there was once who could speak English. In fact, there was a teacher, a woman teacher in the town, who speak excellent English. But it was a country agricultural town. Uh, it, uh, we appropriated the common. They had a large, uh, very an excellent common with uh, crosswalks, cement crosswalks. And I think uh, in the, there might have been a fountain in the center. And we, uh, that was our initial uh, encampment there. And later we moved into the uh, large open air market and uh, bamboo walled it and made it into a headquarters. We spoke of your clothing a moment ago. Uh, was it adequate for the climate you were in? Outside of the gas proofing of the clothing. We shouldn't get rid of that. And they, uh, before we left, it had gas proofed the uh, fatigues and they were very uncomfortable. So after they were washed, they were, we made ourselves comfortable. We uh, tried to make, wear as little as possible. What did gas proofing do to the clothing? Made it heavier, just, less yeah, porous? Less uh, porous, just yeah. uh, made it uh, just too hot for that climate. But so you guys adapted what the had, quartermaster didn't right. think about. <laughs> we washed it out. Yeah. They went the way of the gas mask. Tell us about the kind of terrain you were in. Uh, you said the, the fighting was taking yes, place in the mountains. Fighting, the fighting was in the mountainous terrain, extremely mountainous. Uh, those northern mountains of Luzon are uh, to the tank, are only open to the, actually to the roads. And the attack in Baguio, that's where they principally fought, was on the road leading into Baguio. And in the Bleedy Pass, they were faced with a, a, just a gravel road. And they, as I said, they did bring tanks into some very uh, crazy places to, uh, to fire in. And they, they were very successful in doing that. As, as close in artillery. Were your tanks firing at blockhouses or other tanks? Most, uh, very few other tanks. They had been destroyed very early in the battle for northern Luzon. No, we were firing at cave positions, mm -hmm. mostly. In those mountains, they really didn't need uh, blockhouses. They, they dug out caves and operated and, from And them. they were supported by a, a platoon or two squads of uh, infantry with them? With the tank? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they were well supported by infantry. Uh, of course, at night they would withdraw to a perimeter themselves, and during the daytime they'd have their uh, daily operations, what they had to do. When you were in this uh, little town that you described to us, um, did you feel at any time it was subject to attack? Oh, only maybe an attack, an air attack. I don't think it was no subject to an infiltration. No uh, Banzai charges no, or anything, anything like, like that. that. In fact, we, I think that my, there's a section there for the funniest thing that happened to you. That's when I, we had a special services sergeant, you know, in charge of entertainment for the battalion. We got up in the bright moonlight, and the Japanese used a lone plane to rattle you at night. Washing know, machine Charlie. Washing machine Charlie. And <laughs> he was fellow, all over the Pacific. Wasn't yeah, right. <laughs> this fellow started dancing on the bright moonlight on the cement walk yeah. and saying, I want to die dancing. <laughs> he had a ch small chance of <laughs> <laughs> About uh, how long were you in this town? We were there from uh, right to the uh, end of the war till uh, maybe September of 1945. Okay, let, let's see. Uh, let me ask you one question first before we get back to that. Did you feel your, gut, uh, your officers uh, gave you good leadership and were competent and knew what they were doing? I think we had scattered results on that. We had, Tell us uh, yes we or no, a, some of these. Yeah, we had a, the commander, the unit commander was dismissed and his executive officer from command of the battalion for the inadequacy of the training, I guess, and preparation. And the other officers were, uh, there was a, uh, uh, for I knew them, what I heard and knew about them, there was uh, scattered results for them. Well, in fact, we had an officer that was not considered for a promotion. Uh, 
when you went overseas, they upped him a grade. And he wasn't up from second lieutenant to lieutenant, but he later won the Silver Star. Some of the good men were ignored for some of the, the ones that were poorer. Is this a man you knew, this officer? No, I didn't know him. I knew him. He was a line officer, tank platoon commander. But I remember the, the story. General Douglas MacArthur um, declared the liberation of the Philippines on the 4th of July in 1945. And you say you were there till the end of the war. Right. So um, you heard about in August of the bombing of Hiroshima. That's another thing. Uh, and once Nagasaki. Again, yeah, that's another thing. We never had any direct news of that. I, once again, we were preferred of any uh, news. Uh, when I heard it, I thought it was just another super bomb that developed. I didn't realize it was a new bomb, the atomic bomb. And it was, uh, I, we were preparing at that time for the, we were going to be on in the invasion of Kyushu. Okay, that's my next, uh, thank you, <laughs> that's okay. my next question. The war ended in, the, that is to say the Philippines were liberated. Yeah. You guys were in the Philippines and in parts of the Philippines they were being prepared. Uh, I understand there were 38,000 hospital beds set aside ready for the invasion right. of uh, Kyushu and the other islands in Japan. Did you have any inkling at this time that you were going on and having, yeah. having to go to Japan? Oh yes, we were. That's when I said they, they uh, changed the gun on the tank and that was a clue that they were going to, uh, we were, and we were told we were going to uh, be okay. an invading tell, force. Tell us about that point, uh, how you adapted your weapons to where you thought you were going. We just, that was the main adaption, was the 90 millimeter gun to make it a, uh, a better uh, uh, cannon. Is it, um, since, since the war you've done a lot of looking back, I'm sure, is it true that uh, where you were was th that terrain and the number of troops involved and where you were going were pretty much the same, that they drew parallels? Uh, between Japan and the yeah. Philippines? Yeah, that Kyushu and... Uh, Kyushu, I think, would, uh, as I read later, would have been more uh, difficult for us. Uh, because there was, uh, I think the ground was uh, open mm -hmm. and it was uh, rice paddied, Kyushu. Uh, and I think it would have been much more difficult as a, for us as a unit, a tank unit, they could bring more anti-tank fire on us in, uh, in, in Japan than they would have even in, in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. What and other I preparations think? did your unit make that you were aware of for the invasion of Japan? Outside of that, uh, I don't think there was any, uh, and there was no more additional training at that time, because that happened, the end was in August, so, per, and uh, I, was the invasion, and I might have been for October. So there were, I don't think I of think any- I think the 1st of November was- The well, 1st of November? Yeah. And we weren't, I don't remember any additional training at all. But, but you, you had to do something mentally about this, didn't you? Yes. We're gonna go on from here? We're gonna go on from here. How was that taken? You, you knew that the war in Europe had ended, and you thought, now here we're going on. Right, I thought at one time I was gonna be a colonist in the Pacific. I was gonna be there nearly for all time. But uh, I just thought we would be much more difficult for us, and there'd be many more casualties. Up to that time, we really had light casualties as a tank, as a unit. Mm -hmm. And I thought the Kyushu would be the, uh, maybe the undoing of us. And I, I'm interested in what you've just said, that uh, you heard about the, the two super bombs, uh, but the, not that they were any, anything but oh, large bombs. Right. I didn't know they were this special bomb, this new bomb at all. That's what did you hear specifically? I didn't, as I said, we didn't, we heard very little. Just that there were these two that, that big bombs. The, yes, yeah. and even that maybe came late. I don't know when we, I can't remember we heard that information, but I know it wasn't immediate. Okay, yeah. August 14th, Japan surrenders. Right. And when you had first uh, been drafted and gone to the armed forces, what were the terms of your commitment uh, until, until, the you, until you got all the points and 
could come home? I think it was originally the, your, your, till the end of the war plus a certain number 90 of months. Plus 90 days 90 or something days. like that. Or six months or something. But uh, the points came later in, mm -hmm. after the close of the war. And uh, I think some left early, some men had more points than others. Were you ever given any rest or recreation R and R from your duties? Did, could you go any place and do anything? Uh, we could go to the local and through the local area. Perhaps uh, we never went into Manila, for example. Even after it was uh, uh, liberated, we only go to local, uh, perhaps to as far as Lingayen on the Gulf. And for the no, beaches, is, is that about it? Not even it? in the beaches. There was no transportation for you except you uh, were a driver and had a specific uh, destination. You just couldn't, uh, as an enlisted man, uh, have a jeep at your disposal. To, did, uh, did any USO shows ever come to where you were? Uh, I think I remember going to one, with, uh, I thought it was Bob Hope in New Guinea. And maybe one in the Philippines. I'm not very little. How much did you really know about the enemy you were going to face? Very little. Very little about the enemy until you faced him. And uh, then I know we had a reputation for excess, actually for cruelty. And he had a different code of war than we did. Of course, we knew about. Uh, Bataan, we knew about Hong Kong, so those so those were bad testament to what they were. That was before you uh, were in combat yes. against them, right? Did you, if I, let me use the word, did you respect them as soldiers? I respect them as uh, for their fighting abilities. Yes. Yes. Not for any human abilities they had. They were excellent fighters. But Did your opinion change before or after you were in combat? I think it changed a bit after I was in combat. In, were, in what way? That they were excessive. These men were uh, would do anything in a war. I guess in the larger uh, sense, we we've, might have talked about this a minute ago, our equipment versus their equipment. Much better. Your equipment was much, much, much better. The Japanese had inferior tanks. Uh, they had a, a conglomeration of artillery weapons that didn't, uh, no unification in them. Uh, but and a, as a tank unit, where there was there was no comparison with the Japanese tank, we were much better. They had uh, the tanks were from the early 30s. They had never developed them any further. Uh, they were inefficient as a tank weapon. Did you stop to think at any time that um, the German equipment was superior, at least at the beginning of the war, and the Japanese was inferior, that where you went was, again, the luck of the draw, right. considering what you were up against? Yes, we would have existed uh, for less time in France and Belgium than we would have in the Philippines, because I said we had very light casualties and. I don't think we lost more than five tanks. Maybe some of them by I know one by a terrible accident, by falling off a you know into a ravine off a road near Baguio. But uh, combat losses were very very low. Mm -hmm. So it was a much dis for fighting the, an enemy it was much more desirable than than Europe. Okay, the war is over. Uh, you're in the Philippines. Now what? Now the uh, Say you're gonna, we're gonna use you elsewhere. We're gonna use you as a, uh, bring you down to Manila, and less all your equipment, except the uh, jeeps, trucks. Is this you collectively, the whole battalion? The whole unit went as, yeah. as a one to Manila. You're becoming more or less a security unit. You're gonna guard the equipment in and around Manila. And they just, we just walked out of that Singen, we walked out of Northern Luzon and left everything there, except what was uh, we needed to be, make, have us move. That's good for the guy who buys and sells things. Oh, the guy <laughs> with those wonderful tanks. <laughs> you're in Manila, and you're, um, 
waiting around now, aren't you? Just We're more or less waiting around, just guiding these. Uh, they're just uh, they're as quickly as possible. They're demobilizing, and of course that point system can do being then, and our unit as a whole was about equivalent in, uh, in points. Each so they we went uh, we were going to be sent home as a unit. Well, while you were there now, and, and the war is over, did you get any opportunity to see some historic places like Corregidor or Bataan no, or we didn't. We the didn't at all. hotels in Manila or anything no, like that? No, it was just a wrecked city to us. We didn't uh, have a chance to. Uh, there was no tours. Uh, I don't. We never offered to, a chance to see any of those, uh, ex except you would maybe initiate it on your own. Yeah. I just we just saw the wrecked city. There are stories of uh, the United States leaving an awful lot of equipment in, in the Philippines and elsewhere yeah. in the Pacific. Uh, did you see any of that? I only saw what, was, what we left. And I, I really, in Manila, of course, uh, that was still there when we left Manila. We were still a guard unit up to that point when we left, so. Of course, it was, we were told that by you other people, other service people, that uh, it was just being dumped, just be, but just left in place. Or driven off a cliff somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Off a cliff, yeah. How did you get home? We were brought to an assembly camp below Manila and uh, uh, we were sent home as a unit. We went home again in a better troop ship this time. Non-stop again? Non-stop again. Nobody goes to Hawaii these days. No one to Hawaii, <laughs> no. We go right uh, up over the northern, brought us up the northern tip of Luzon and straight across the Pacific to San Francisco, which was a great sight. And you pulled in there when? In 46? We December of 1945. 45? Yeah, the late December of 1945. And uh, we're there, we're brought back to uh, where we'd started from, Camp Stoneman at Pittsburgh, California, for the same camp we'd left. Tell us about sailing under the Golden Gate Bridge. It was wonderful. What, what, what were I your feelings about that? I think I couldn't believe we were home again, that it was uh, all over. I thought it was going to be a terribly long time out there in the Pacific. Because with no news, as I said, you really didn't have any idea how long this was going to be or what they were doing. And uh, I think we come in and the Saratoga was there. She was moving sailing out. Really? And yeah. uh, it was a great feeling to be home again. Have you made an effort since th then, you know, over the intervening years, to catch up on what you missed by being there, to read the books, to see what I, happened to yes, you in the larger view? I did. I did. I just, the United States Army has publishes the United States Army in World War II, a series of books. Uh, and I was I read through the, uh, the ones on the Pacific there of victory in Papua, mm -hmm. the approach to the Philippines, there's one on Leyte, and there's one uh, victory in the Philippines. That's basically on Luzon. So that, the uh, Army done an excellent job on, uh, on filling all the, that information in. Uh, the, the writing varies from book to book, but overall it's, it's excellent. Were you shipped home uh, to where? Where did you go from California? We were shipped, we fl were flown home to uh, uh, New Jersey. To uh, Dix? No. An air we were dropped off at an uh, airport there. We were flown across the uh, uh, United States and then we took a train up to uh, Devons where we were uh, processed and discharged. So uh, we had how, a many, how many of you are, are part of this group? Did the battalion lose guys as they went oh, across the country? Oh, they were the dispersed. Country? They were yeah. sent to an airfield in Sacramento, mm -hmm. and they were as they they were dispersed by the uh, where they came from. When you got back to Devons, were there any of the original party that you had set out with? No, nobody at all. You were yeah, alone once again, again. Once again, we were. I was alone. Yes. It Tell us the day you were discharged. I think January 1946, maybe about the 18th. I'd have to look, really look it up. Tell us about that day, your feelings. You're, you're going to get out today. I you're, think that was sort of post-mortem. Yeah. We were, uh, we'd arrived and uh, we were just, it was just a matter of waiting to, to get out. Uh, I managed to get a ride home with somebody being picked up. I, 
had become acquainted with and they dropped me off and I think I came back to my father's store in Hyde Park and walked in through the door and said hello to him. And with him, of course, he'd, he'd seen other men come back and he'd come back himself. Yeah. And now you're wearing a ruptured duck and... A ruptured duck <laughs> and uh, all spruced up with uh, new, new clothes. Was there a most memorable experience in your whole career? It's something that stands out more than anything else. Oh. I think that landing in the Philippines was the most uh, an abrupt change in your life when you were leaving a normal life and going into a life that uh, was really endangered. I think that was the most mem memorable experience. Do you think about that sometimes? Not badly, no, because we didn't really receive any. If we were close engaged, it would have been even much, much harder. We were only engaged at night with the, the shelling. But that was, I think that was the, uh, that defined the change from one life to another. Mm -hmm. Have you shared this with your family? Uh, yes, they're, they're very good about it. I've shared this and, and I've shared my father had much more experience than I did in a war. He was an infantry man and uh, I've shared both with, with my family. That's very good and I'm, I'm glad you're doing this today. Was there a most memorable character that you can think about? A regular army man. He'd been uh, in Hawaii, he'd served in uh, various infantry divisions. He'd been in Louisiana maneuvers in the 1940s. Of course, his problem was alcohol. And uh, he was just moved along from one unit to another. Uh, a very uh, New Yorker, much of a New Yorker. Uh, he'd, uh, he'd been a military policeman in Louisiana maneuvers and had, been, had sent units Miss sent them different directions. <laughs> so he was, he was on a, he eventually landed with us. And once again, he was a, a pro, he was a, he was a problem for the, the, the commanding officer, the unit. And he was moved on. But he, be, one, he went sent to an infantry unit in Luzon and he won a bronze star. He finally found a home. He found, he found a home. That's what he told me. He said, if I hadn't been in the army, I'd have been in prison. We sent him, we made a collection. His entire pay was devoted to court martial fines. So we, we collected money for him to send him home for his last furlough to New York, and he was arrested there <laughs> and was sent back to us. But in, in, the, uh, in the Luzon, he was, uh, they just couldn't put up with him anymore. And they, they just, want, what other units had done, they, they sent him on to another one. Have you seen him since the no, war? No, I've never seen him since. Ever heard from him? Never heard from him. No. He was a fellow I don't think would write letters. Yeah. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations after you no, got I discharged? No, Did I didn't. Any particular reason? No, I always I think I'm not an association person. We have an association I, that I'm a member of, the 775th Tank Battalion Association. I'm a, uh, of course, you're a distant member of it. They're, uh, they only get together for a uh, a uh, yearly uh, uh, get-together, and I haven't even been at one of those. I was say, uh, they've been last year, they were at Polk again, which I'm sorry I missed. <laughs> you missed Polk? <laughs> Not that much, but a lot. What were your feelings? You walked into your father's store that day at Hyde Park. I uh, was relieved. I was glad it was, you know, that this whole thing was over with. Uh, I thought it would I'd done what I'd been uh, asked to do, and I'd done it uh, without uh, problems, and I'd finished my commitment. How important to you was serving in the military? I think it was good for me, because uh, it gave me a, it gave me to, you have to live collectively together. You have to be able to support each other. And I wish we could do that in society as we did in the military. We had a, you couldn't get away from living together. Uh, cooperation was essential. In that sense then, uh, it, it affected the rest of your life? It did, yes. Your outlook? Yeah. I was made fun of for saying to my children, you've got to think and act collectively. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think then, 
and, and what do you think now about the war you were involved in? I think it was, there was no, I feel no shame about that war or uh, bad feelings about it, that we had served in it. Uh, I think it was a necessary war uh, for the entire world. And I was glad I was able to uh, play a part, a part, small part in it, even as, as a uh, part of a battalion headquarters, uh, which I was very lucky to be in. Have you given any thought, Herb, to the uh, difference in, in public opinion regarding the reception you got when you came home and um, the greetings that were in front of guys from Korea or Vietnam? I really, I really didn't realize at that time. I guess we had some local uh, people that knew us would uh, be happy to see us again, but I, I didn't notice any broad, you know, outpouring from the citizenry that our neighbors and my neighbors and my friends and my relatives would be glad to see you home, but outside I don't remember any large-scale demonstration of uh, when I come home. How about for the uh, greetings that the Korean guys got or the Vietnam War guys got? They, I, I, I thought I was always neutral about that. I thought they would expect to get that greetings in any war. You don't really, no one's going to slap you on the back. Because I can remember my father telling me, you can't expect that. In fact, he was, uh, when he came back to Northern Ireland on a, being wounded, they, they jeered him because he had volunteered and it wasn't necessary to volunteer in Ireland. They said, you know, you're foolish. You shouldn't be in a war. So I didn't think, I don't think you could expect much approbation after a war. You've just served in it and uh, that's it. Since uh, your discharge and up to now, um, did you ever receive any veterans' benefits, as they're called, uh, hospitalization or the GI Bill or insurance or something like that? Well, I had the insurance policy, which was excellent. Yeah. It still is. It's a wonderful policy. Uh, and I had the a house. I bought the house under the GI Bill, my present home. And I had, but that's what the use I made of it was, uh, it was a wonderful country to be able to do that for you. I know my father got nothing. In fact, he owed money at the, he was able to draw money ahead of time and uh, he left with a debt to the British Army and uh, never got anything else. Did he ever pay it? No. <laughs> Didn't have to. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> Herb, is there any one thought, memory that you would like to share with us or your family uh, that we haven't talked about this morning? Outside of what I've said, I don't think there's much more. That you should uh, try and make this thing work, the society work as much as you can. That you should all act together. Uh, that's about the best thing I can ask, tell them to do. And not to engage in too many wars. We thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you, John. You've been a very good uh, guy to come in and tell us about your life, and yeah. we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.